Welcome to the second of our two-part series on first-order sensors. This lesson focuses on the time response of first-order sensors to sinusoidal inputs. We have a good idea of how our first-order sensors respond to step inputs, so let's continue by looking at how they respond to sinusoidal inputs. Here is the differential equation describing the time response, and instead of the step input, um, we now have a sinusoidal input. So our uh, sinusoidal input has an amplitude A and a frequency omega. I'm also going to add here an initial condition, so y of uh, time t equals zero is going to be equal to y sub zero. And I'm going to start the sinusoidal input at time t equals zero. So prior to time t equals zero, my input is going to be zero, and at time equals zero, I'll now input my sine wave. Here then is the solution to this differential equation. So y of t is equal to c times e to the minus t over tau, um, and that component of the solution should be familiar. But my steady state component now is going to be quite different. So here I have a sinusoid, um, and I'm at the same frequency. So I had an input frequency of omega, and my time response, the steady state component, has a uh, frequency at the same omega. You'll notice the magnitude now of this steady state component. It's going to be equal to k times a, uh, but now it's divided by the square root of 1 plus omega tau squared. And I also have now some phase shift associated with my time response of the arctan of omega times tau. So this magnitude and the sine term, um, they're making up the steady state component of my time response. And this exponential term, c times e to the minus t over tau, um, that's making up the transient component of my time response. The value of c, that'll be dependent on my initial condition. And I can rewrite this magnitude term um, as capital M of omega. Here, m of omega, that'll be 1 over the square root of 1 plus quantity uh, omega times tau squared. Um, and then we can rewrite our phase component as phi of omega. That'll be equal to minus the arctan of omega times tau. And this allows me to uh, write a more um, condensed version of my time response according to y of t is equal to c times e to the minus t over tau. That's still the same. Um, but now the steady state component is going to be k times a times capital M of omega, that magnitude, times sine of omega t plus now capital phi of omega. That'll be my phase component. And you'll notice then that the magnitude of my steady state response, um, as well as the phase, they're both dependent now on that frequency omega. And we can refer to them uh, as the magnitude ratio and the phase shift. Let's take a look at the magnitude ratio, and I've rewritten the magnitude ratio here. I have a capital M of omega, so the magnitude ratio is a function of omega, it's a function of frequency, and that's equal to 1 over the square root of 1 plus the quantity omega times tau squared. And what I'd like to do is to get an idea, a graphical sense, if you will, of how this magnitude is changing with respect to different input frequencies, with respect to different omegas. And so graphically, I'm going to take a look at a plot of my magnitude ratio um, with respect to different input frequencies on my x-axis, and I'll look at that magnitude ratio in decibels. Let's begin by taking a look when uh, my omega times tau, when, when that term is significantly less than 1. So we'll start here with omega times tau is much less than 1. In this case, my omega times tau term effectively falls away, um, and I can write my magnitude term as 1 over the square root of 1, which is just equal to 1. And in terms of dBs, um, this magnitude in decibels, that'll be 20 times log of base 10 of 1, um, which is equal to 0 dBs. Let's continue and take a look at the case where omega times tau is equal to 1. I could also write this as omega is equal to 1 over tau. If this is the case, uh, my omega times tau term is 1, so I end up with 1 over the square root of 1 plus 1 squared, or 1 over square root of 2, which in dBs will be 20 times log base 10 of 1 over square root of 2, or minus 3 dBs. And then finally, let's look at the scenario where omega times tau is much greater than 1. And I could rewrite that uh, by saying omega is much greater than 1 over tau. 
in this case, I end up with uh, 1 over the square root of 1 plus omega tau squared, but that one term is having um, less and less of a contribution as omega tau gets uh, much, much more greater than 1. So I end up with 1 over the square root of quantity omega tau squared or 1 over quantity omega times tau. And if I write this in dBs, I end up with uh, 20 times log of the base 10 of quantity 1 over omega tau, um, which is equal to minus 20 uh, log of omega times tau. So let's take a look at these results graphically. Um, if I head over to my magnitude versus frequency plot here, I end up with the following results. Um, in blue is the, let's call it the actual curve. So if I went in and started plugging different values of omega times tau into my um, magnitude ratio here, and in red is going to be my piecewise approximation, right? So I'm basically looking at, uh, for small omega, uh, I'll have a magnitude ratio of one or zero dBs. So that's my flat line here. At uh, mega times tau equals one, I'll end up with uh, minus three dB. So if I were to plug in, I'd end up with minus three dB here. And as omega tau becomes much greater than one, uh, we could plug in various values. For example, if that ratio is uh, 10, if I plug in minus 20 log of 10 here, I'll end up with minus 20 dB. If I plug in 100, I'll end up with minus 40. And so this blue curve will head down uh, at a constant slope uh, for higher and higher frequencies. And that slope is going to be minus 20 dBs per decade. So a decade in frequency, here's 10 to 100, another decade would be 100 to 1,000. And that slope is going to go from minus 20 dBs down to minus 40. So the slope is minus 20 dBs per decade. Um, and in red, I've given uh, an idea of the piecewise approximation using these three scenarios, omega tau much less than one, omega tau equal to one, and omega tau uh, greater than one. So what I have here is a graphical description of what's happening to the magnitude ratio. And, and recall, I have a first order sensor here uh, that I have an, a sinusoidal input to that first order sensor. And at higher frequencies, this magnitude ratio, this ratio of output over input, um, is decreasing at a uh, at a minus 20 dB per decade rate, right? So for uh, low frequency inputs, my output is effectively matching my input. And for high frequency inputs, uh, my output is um, severely attenuated. So what I have here is effectively a low pass filter. Let's work through an example now and take a deeper look at this. Let's consider a temperature that is varying, and the frequency of the temperature is varying between 1 and 5 hertz. The question is going to be, what is an acceptable time constant of this particular temperature sensor, such that uh, the temperature that we're measuring, uh, we can measure that within an error of 2%. So this magnitude error is telling me how to set up this problem. Right. What it's telling me is that um, I need a magnitude ratio um, that is between 0 0.98 and 1.02. And I could look at these in decibels as well. Now, at this point, it's important to note that for a first order system, for a first order system, the magnitude ratio is always less than one. Right. As we just saw graphically, uh, one is equal to zero dB. So the maximum magnitude ratio I can have for a first order system, that's going to be one. So what I'm effectively saying is that my magnitude ratio um, needs to be greater than 0 0.98. So let's rewrite this in a form we're familiar with. We have 0 0.98 is now less than one over the square root of one plus quantity omega times tau squared. And the tau, that's the time constant of our sensor. And in fact, based on the problem statement, this is the uh, item of interest. This is what we're trying to solve for. And let's also recall our graphical description of the magnitude ratio. It looks something like this. So if I'm looking at my magnitude ratio uh, with respect to an input frequency, I'll have a maximum of zero dBs or one in a linear sense, right? And that's going to uh, proceed. And then when I get to omega equals one over tau, uh, that's going to uh, fall off at minus 20 dBs per decade. Since we have this roll off at higher frequencies, um, if I need to achieve an error within 2%, um, then I want to take a look at these higher frequencies to define um, the description of that error, right? So I'm interested in the higher frequencies. In this case, that's 5 hertz. 
So I could come in here then and I can plug in five hertz for my frequency. So omega, my radial frequency, that'll be two pi times five hertz, and that'll be 31.4 radians per second. And so I'll rewrite this equation with that plugged in. So now I have one over square root of one plus uh, quantity 31.4 tau squared, and that's uh, greater than 0 0.98. I'll rearrange this equation a bit um, and effectively uh, pull the tau out of the equation. Um, and then if I solve, I'll end up with 0 0.2 must be greater than 31.4 tau. And this basically tells me, essentially tells me that my tau, uh, the time constant of the temperature sensor I'm using, that must be less than 6.5 milliseconds. So this time constant of 6.5 milliseconds, that's driven uh, by this error of 2%, right? So this magnitude error uh, that we need to achieve of 2% is driving this time constant, this tau. Um, if I would relax this error a bit, say to 5% or 10%, what we'd find based on the math here um, is that the time constant would need to be less than a bigger number. So we could effectively um, slow the system down a bit. Let's recall quickly the time response of our first order sensor, Y of T. We had a transient component, uh, which we're ignoring for the time being, uh, so that we can look at our steady state component. Um, and in the steady state component, we had a magnitude ratio as well as a phase shift. And so now let's take a look at that phase shift and let's see how that's affected uh, by frequency in the same way that the magnitude ratio is um, affected by the same way that it's dependent on uh, frequency. The phase, that'll be defined by the negative uh, arctan of omega times tau. And so I can use this description to take a look graphically um, at how my phase is going to change relative to an input frequency in the same way that I was looking at the magnitude ratio, how that was changing with respect to input frequency. Uh, we can do the same thing in terms of phase. Let's start in the same fashion. Um, let's start by looking at omega times tau when that is much less than one, um, which I can rewrite as I've shown here as omega much less than quantity one over tau. And in that case, the inverse tangent, the arctan of something uh, small, a lot less than one, that's going to be equal to zero degrees. Similarly, for the case where omega tau is equal to one, or I can rewrite that as omega equals one over tau, in that case, I'll be looking at a specific frequency. Uh, so if I plug in, I have my uh, capital phi of one over tau, that's going to be equal to uh, the negative arctan of tau over tau or one. Um, in that case, uh, my phi will be equal to minus 45 degrees. And then finally, for omega times tau uh, much greater than one, or my frequency omega is much greater than one over the time constant, in this case, uh, minus the arctan of a very large number, um, that's going to result in a phi of omega equal to minus 90 degrees. And so let's take a look at that graphically. Here in my plot of phase as a function of frequency, we see at lower frequencies, uh, my phase is at zero degrees, as expected. Uh, in the case where omega tau is equal to one, my phase is minus 45 degrees, again, as expected. And as my uh, frequency increases, I transition to minus 90 degrees. So for very large input frequencies, my phase is going to be minus 90 degrees. And so here I've drawn the full curve, um, and I could have drawn this in a piecewise fashion just as my magnitude ratio, uh, just to give us an idea of sort of the, um, the tangent lines, if you will, given particular input frequencies. And you see it follows that same form, right? Lower frequencies, a zero degree phase shift, uh, and then transitioning to higher frequencies, uh, minus 90 degrees of phase. And so this would be my piecewise approximation um, that would allow me to do exactly that, to approximate the true uh, graphical representation of my phase shift. So if we were to consider both plots then, the magnitude ratio and the phase shift, um, at these lower input frequencies, we're gonna see a uh, lack of phase shift, zero degrees phase shift, um, and our output magnitude is gonna be at the same magnitude as the input. Um, and then for higher input frequencies, um, that phase is going to shift and we're gonna end up getting uh, at higher and higher frequencies, minus 90 degrees of phase. Um, at the same time, our magnitude ratio is going to be changing. So the output magnitude is going to be decreasing dramatically, if you recall, 
uh, for these higher frequencies. 